Okay, here we are on week 10 out of 12, so we're getting close to the end. Um, I know you're all feeling very, very, very burnt out. I apologize if I'm talking quietly. Um, it is four o'clock in the morning, um, and my kids are asleep, so I'm trying to not wake them up. Um, and I have to go downtown at 6.30, so I'm trying to record this before I have to get uh, do the two-hour commute into the city. Um, I'm feeling what you guys are feeling. Uh, in fact, I thought long and hard about um, begging you guys for a one-day extension on this, but I realized that that just moved the pain over until tomorrow. Um, I know that doesn't always work for all of you, so that is by no means belittling anyone who does need that break. Um, I respect that. Um, knowing when you're at your limit is really, really important. Um, so feel free to reach out to me if you need to. Uh, but here I am at four o'clock in the morning to record this lecture for you. Uh, today we are doing wood design. Last week we talked about, um, or two weeks ago, because we had reading week, um, which it sounds like for most of you was not uh, that relaxing, which is really unfortunate. Um, uh, I, I, I tried to I tried to make it as easy as I could, um, but I know you guys are coming to the end of like the re a really important term, so uh, you probably couldn't relax as much as you had hoped. Hopefully you got to sleep a little bit. Uh, this week we're going to look at designing with wood. So we're going to do similar to what we did with steel a few weeks ago. Now wood is interesting. Steel, they go into a plant, there's a chemist there, they take things, they mix it up in a batch. Um, I picture someone going, ha, ha, ha. Uh, but really they have a chemist there that tests every batch. It's very highly refined. Uh, wood, we go down and chop stuff out of the woods. Uh, there is no science in it. So we have to put the science into figuring out what its capacity is. Um, now, we don't just go into the woods and cut it down. We have a very good grow program here in Canada on how we manage our forests and what woods we can and cannot cut down um, and how we have to replenish that and the, the way we allow it to grow. Um, but most of that is because um, my ancestors, not the ancestors for all of you, were total jerks like 100, 200, 300 years ago, came in and cut down all the really good forest wood uh, and used it to make big, uh, big houses and big train stations um, that benefited only those particular users, uh, which is unfortunate. So we're left without a lot of that now. Um, it's not that that wood doesn't exist or was bad wood, it's that we used it all and it is a slow growing wood. So we try to focus on fast growing uh, lumbers that we can manage and replace as we use them. Um, but wood has a lot of other weird things going on with it. So before we can dig into the design, which is almost identical to the steel process, almost identical, close, but not, not exactly the same, but pretty darn close. We have, before we can look at that, we have to talk about all the things that impact or could impact one particular piece of wood in our design. So let's move over to that. Okay, so let's talk about wood first. For most of you, this might be something you've been hearing since you were, you know, five years old in school. For some of you, it might be, be new information depending on where you went to school uh, and what you were exposed to. Here in Canada, the, the way we experience a forest is very heavily talked about. So for all of you, this might not be quite so apparent. So our hardwoods are deciduous trees, mostly deciduous trees, not always. We do have some coniferous trees that are hardwoods, but that is the rarity. It is so small that we're not even gonna talk about it. A hardwood or a deciduous tree, they're the ones that if you went outside right now, you'd be able to pick them out no problem because all of the leaves are falling off of them right now. So they shed their leaves at the end of each growing season. Softwoods, usually the coniferous trees, are the ones that um, instead of leaves, I mean, they're still leaves, uh, but they're needle-like. So they usually have a cone um, 
instead of pods or seeds or anything else, they have a cone. So whether uh, it, so usually you, you would talk about them as pine cones, or as my kids will say, pine corns. Um, most coniferous trees keep their leaves, which are their needles, throughout the winter, giving them the name evergreens. Um, you can see my fake one here in the background. I do love Christmas. That is not to offend anyone that does not celebrate the holiday. Uh, I, uh, I don't do it on a religious grounds. Uh, I do it on, uh, I really like it and it's super fun. Um, and it makes me feel warm and cozy as we enter the deep, dark depths of winter. Uh, in Canada, most of the lumber and wood products come from the more plentiful softwoods. Now, these are more plentiful because that's what we have left, because they're fast growing. We came in and cut everything down, almost everything, and now these are what are growing back because they grow fast. We now have learned our lesson, hopefully, uh, and we allow these to continue to grow to try to replenish our forests somewhat. Uh, poplar and aspen are getting more popular um, uh, for LVL and PSL, so those would be some of our hardwoods, um, because they, uh, they are fast growing as well. So we're starting to see those get used and they grow straight, pretty, pretty straight. And so they're good for our LVLs and PSLs. Remember, those are our ones that we kind of almost peel them up and then assemble it in some way and glue it together. Okay, so what are the different species of structural wood? Now, these are uh, the four that we tend to use the most for construction, but then we lump them up in weird ways, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. But these are the ones that most of you would kind of conventionally know as the, as the type of woods that we would use. So there are 30 common softwoods in Canada, but only four of them are the ones we really use for construction. Spruce. Spruce is the one that we use for uh, most of our construction. It is cheap. So we have uh, two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, two by tens, two by twelves, you know, all of that kind of usual stuff. Um, I just realized I wanted to just check something here. Um, don't mind me. I'm, uh, I'm not ignoring you guys. Give me one quick second. Um, so, uh, so spruce tends to be the most common one that we use for all of our structural orders. So if you go to Home Depot, what you're buying is probably spruce. If you're building a deck, you're probably buying spruce. Unless it's outside, and then maybe you're using cedar. Pine is really common for trim work. I'm going to throw you off in the next slide what I do with spruce and pine. But don't worry about that. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Cedar. Cedar is really common for decks and exterior applications. Cedar has some inherent um, protection properties. So it, if you've ever worked with cedar, it has a very distinctive smell. That smell was uh, produced through evolution to help repel bugs and rot. So because bugs don't like it and it doesn't rot as easily, it's really good for outdoor applications and it looks so nice. It's really kind of gorgeous lumber. Uh, Douglas fir, but cedar is not as strong as our spruce, so we kind of make a compromise. It works better for being protected naturally, um, but it's not as strong as the spruce. Douglas fir is what we tend to use for heavy construction, or basically we, we mill these up and then glue them together to make our glue lamp. Is almost always Douglas fir. Not always, I've seen other ones, but commonly, Douglas fir is our glue lamb. Now, all of those woods have different strengths. If they all have different strengths, we need some way to talk about them. And so what we do is we lump types of woods that have similar uh, characteristics or similar properties. Because remember, steel, way back when we used 300 MPA steel and now we use 350. After we hot roll it, it's 345, uh, but steel was steel, and E was always 200,000 MPA. Um, how the frack is a fly in here? Um, wood, if you're talking about spruce 
or you're talking about uh, cedar or you're talking about Douglas fir, they all have different strength properties. We're going to see it gets even more complicated than that, but let's see how we might group them. So what they've done is they've said Douglas fir and larch all have similar properties. So um, D fir L is often what we'll lump that as. Hem fir gets, which is um, a particular type of fir, so not the Douglas fir, but uh, this particular fir here, which I've never worked with, but I have worked with hemlock. Hemlock is really good for, for um, docks and things like that. It's really good for in water applications. Spruce pine fir. Spruce pine fir, or SPF, is the ubiquitous property or the ubiquitous design wood. Remember, it's, if we're using it structurally, it's almost always spruce, but pine has kind of some lumped in properties that are the same. Except for, if you're Canadian and you love group of seven, not white pine. White pine does not get lumped in to our spruce pine fir. I know, why would we call it spruce pine fir if there are some firs that don't fit in it? Well, for you guys, you're not gonna need to worry. Spruce is the one that we use for design. If you're going into Home Depot, you are buying SPF and it is a spruce piece of lumber. So the cheapest, the most common, the most normal kind of wood we use for construction in Canada is SPF nominal lumber. Remember nominal means it's our two by four, two by six, two by eight, two by 10, two by 12. So SPF, nominal dimension lumber is the norm. Maybe that's a great quiz question, for example. Um, Northern species um, is where we lump all of those other ones. So our, uh, our white pine would get lumped in here and our cedar. So if you're building a deck out of cedar, which you can also go to Home Depot and buy your cedar, uh, we would be talking about a northern species, which means it has a lower strength capacity and usually a lower E. Remember, E is its stiffness or its modulus of elasticity or how easily it deforms. So let's just quickly talk about the cross-section of a tree. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, I'm not going to test you on this, but it's helpful to know kind of what the makeup of a tree is because it's going to lend itself into some of the other properties we're gonna talk about. So most of you know that you can tell how old a tree is by looking at its rings. A tree speeds up its growth in the spring and it slows down until it stops completely in the winter. So you can see these zones with really fast growth that taper off and then there's a hard line where it stops up again. So. Those are our rings. So here's, here's an annular growth ring, kind of cut out of a little section here. So you can see that in the spring it grows really fast, in the summer it grows really slow, and in the fall, once it starts losing its leaves, or not, if it's a, a coniferous tree, it stops growth. We have our bark. Um, you can see these lines in here. We've got um, rays. Uh, going through the wood. So those are kind of natural flaws within the interior of the lumber. We have the heartwood, which is the old growth. And we have the sapwood, which is the new growth, which um, is kind of where all of the sap moves up and down through the tree. Uh, so this wood is going to be a little bit harder than this wood. This is going to be very moist and full of sap. So here's a kind of a close-up of it. Here is uh, one year of growth. Imagine a tree is like a bundle of straws and we've kind of clamped it together with the bark holding it together. Um, in each year th these cells are very large. This is where it grows really 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 fast and then it slows down in the summer, kind of takes a lazy approach to growth and then there's a hard line stop in the fall and it starts again the next year. So let's talk about some of the things that make it hard to design in wood. What things might affect its strength? And then we'll talk about how we deal with that. So these are the things that are, these are kind of the thing about wood. Um, and in the next slide, we'll talk about how we develop factors 
that we can use in wood design that are based on these characteristics. So wood has moisture. I was just talking about the, the kind of growth of wood and that there's sap in, the, in those sap rings and the new growth happening in the wood. Well, that sap is moisture. If anyone's ever touched it, it's very, very sticky. Uh, but when you first cut it, it comes out almost as a liquid. Anyone who's ever tapped a maple tree knows that you can put basically a spigot into your tree and open a tap and you can collect uh, liquid. Now, for those of you who maybe have never done it but have used maple syrup, it does not look like that. I think it reduces to about a tenth of its volume to make maple syrup. So the amount of liquid that comes out to make one bottle of maple syrup was a much larger amount of liquid. So wood has moisture. You can imagine that could have an impact on its strength. Um, like what happens when it dries out or how does it change? Wood shrinks. So wood can, as it kind of sits over time, it changes its dimension. It's not a lot, but a thing that was this tall could be this tall. It doesn't look like I moved my hand at all, but if we need everything tight together, that can have an impact. It's been less of an impact on residential construction, which for the past hundred years or so has been uh, pretty much all we could do with wood construction. We built it into our calculations, but it didn't have that big of an impact. As we're going taller, we're seeing the fact that wood shrinks has a bigger and bigger impact. Um, I think over the height of a story, wood can shrink about a quarter of an inch. That's pretty significant. And if I go down into my basement, so this house was built in uh, the early 1870s, I just found a map that it shows up on in 1876. So it was built previous to that. In the basement, you can see that there are posts that aren't connected to anything. The wood has shrunk um, and the post now is a little bit loose because it doesn't fit tight anymore. Um, so there are, we, we've put in steel posts in the basement to kind of deal with that. But on, um, a, I don't know, say a 15 story, or let's even say a 10 story building, that quarter of an inch um, uh, starts to become very significant. So that's like what? Uh, two and a half inches over the building. If you have an elevator in there, your steel is not shrinking uh, and your building is, you're gonna have a difference over uh, at your door as the wood shrinks. So that is one of the problems that people are trying to solve in mass timber construction right now. Wood's not isotropic. So our steel was isotropic and that's just a fancy way of saying it behaves the same in every direction. So if you bent it this way or this way, or I said this way, this way, or uh, that way, <laughs> uh, no matter what way you bend it, uh, it's, or that way I should say, all three directions, it's going to behave the exact same. Um, or if you squashed it in all three directions, it's gonna behave the exact same. Non-isotropic means it does not behave the same in each direction. Remember those cells that look like a bundle of straws? You can imagine if you squash it in this direction versus if you squash it in that direction, you're going to get very different behavior. Wood's not perfect. So remember those internal checks we could see uh, in the, the wood, but also what happens when you cut your wood and um, uh, there's um, a, a branch growing out of it. You end up with a knot there. So all of those things add imperfections to the piece of lumber. Wood creeps, which is different than shrinking. Wood, as it sits, so if we had it like this and we put a big point load on top, it would slowly deform some. Not a lot, but it would have a deformation that is not about its stresses. And if we took that load off, it would not rebound to its original shape but it is not part of plastic behavior. It is about the fact that it creeps. So it's not due to stresses, it's due to creep, which is not the same thing. Wood rots. 
So, uh, you know, it can, um, in the right conditions, start to degrade. It can also get eaten by bugs. Um, and the big one, wood burns. So if you put it in the right conditions, wood can catch fire. It is combustible. Um, we talked last week about how that doesn't mean it has a bad fire rating, but it does burn. It is combustible. So we can translate that into factors that we use when we design for wood. We actually have one extra factor that we're going to add in that's right here where we talk about buckling. We knew in steel that whether it's a column or a beam, we had to deal with buckling. So there was lateral stability where it tried to pop out sideways or lateral torsional buckling when we bent it that uh, the top tried to move to either side. So there's one factor right away we know we have to talk about. Let's talk about the others. Well, there's different types of wood. We know that there's um, uh, uh, like spruce and pine. So we need to figure out what species we're using. There's different grade categories. What we're doing with the wood gives it different properties. But you're thinking, what, why, how? But when they're cutting the wood and assigning it to different size groups, they are looking at it and making judgments based on what properties they think it has. And to do that, they lump it into a grade category. Don't worry, I'm gonna walk you through this. The size. Now, as a piece of wood gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the flaws that it could have are harder and harder to see. So the bigger it is, we actually have a size factor that's reducing its capacity. If we have a small member, we can look at it. We know if there's a knot on that or the fact that there's a knot hidden inside it is much smaller. You can imagine if we had a big piece of lumber like this and there was a massive flaw inside it like that, we wouldn't be able to see. But on a tiny little kind of two by four, which is only about that big, we'd be able to see on its length if there was any major knots on it, giving us really good confidence in its capacity. System effects. This one always messes with people. The system effects are, does it have, um, think of it as teamwork. Does it have other things close to it doing the same job? I'm going to tell you that system effects is really only for joists and studs. If we have joists and studs, we're saying that they're connected together by a piece of plywood, and that piece of plywood means even if we're only putting load on one of them, the plywood forces the other ones beside it to work with it. Just a tiny little bit, but we can increase the capacity of the member due to system effects for joists and studs. Load duration. How long does the load sit on it? Remember that creep, that creeping uh, factor we talked about? So that would be part of that. Service condition, is it wet or dry? So that's whether, uh, it, it, uh, that's whether it's inside or outside. So whether it could be prone to rot, for example. Um, what chemicals have we put in it? Because we can do things to treat it for rot and for fire retardants. Um, and then, like I said, lateral stability. So I am going to show you a series of charts now, and I will go through an example of uh, what we do to look for these. I'm almost positive we go through kind of a full example of these. Do we pull one up together? Ah, we don't, so maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll add one of those in. I'll see if I can find one. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through one verbally and then I'll add it into the lecture slide. That might not be until later today because I have to go downtown the second I finish recording this. Add, find, factors. I was sure I had one in here because I know I ask you to do it a little bit in the assignment. Okay, so this is the grade category. So we have to figure out um, we want to know what our grade is before we can kind of, or we want to find a grade category before we can go on and do what we need to do. 
So what we do is we take a guess at what piece of lumber we're going to use for construction. We'll know based on, because we're picking the piece of wood, whether it's going to be, uh, what its grade's gonna be and what its sizes are, and that will allow us to pick our grade category. Now, grades are broken into construction, standard. These ones we're not going to use. So don't worry about this right here. Cross that off. Um, we're going to have stud, number one, number two, number three, or select structural. Those are the ones we're going to use. Um, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put a line through the top one and the bottom one because we're just not gonna use those. Uh, once we pick whether, then we can figure out, is it a stud? Is it structural light framing? Is it a structural joist and plank? Beam and stringer or post and timber? Once we know that, we'll know what strength table to use. So the next four slides are all the tables that tell us what its strength and its modulus of elasticity are. So here's one for uh, structural joist and planks, structural light framing, and stud grade categories of lumber. So if we knew we had, uh, let's take a look here, a uh, two by eight, um, number one, number two, SPF number one, number two. So, um, S, so a two by eight, uh, it doesn't fit this category. This would be a two by four. Uh, it could fit this, but we don't have a stud grade. Structural light framing, hmm, it doesn't fit this because this is only a two by four. Uh, a two by eight, ah, well, it's smaller dimension is 38. It's bigger dimension is 114 or more, and it's a number one, number two SPF. So number one, number two, come over here, structural joists and planks. Kind of makes sense. We were using joists, two by eight joists. Well, now we know all of our strength properties that we're going to pull off to use for any calculations are going to come from the structural joist and plank table, which is table A. So structural joist and plank right here. Now we knew we were using spruce pine fir or SPF, number one, number two. And look at this, for bending at the extreme fiber, FB is 11.8. Jiminy Cricket steel was 350 MPA. Our joist that we're using only has 11.8 MPA. It's even less for shear. So remember shear, is 1.5 and then we have our compression so compression parallel to the grain the grain is our straws so if we had our bundle of straws and all of our straws are running like this compression parallel to the grain is the way we build most of our elements for posts and columns so we have 11.5 mpa so whether it's bending shear or compression we have different MPA values or, or uh, uh, strength or our stress capacity. Uh, and then over here, modulus of elasticity. We have different modulus of elasticity for all of these properties. This is just our stru structural joist and plank and light framing and stud categories. This is the one that I said we would not be using. But look at this. We now have a different table for beams and stringers. So here's our spruce pine fir, and they actually care if it's number one or number two. And then we have post and timber grades. So we have more character, different characteristics here. So we have to know what table we're using before we can even pull up what our capacities are. So that's how we get our strength and our modulus of elasticity. But then we have to apply factors, sometimes to the modulus of elasticity, but also sometimes to the strength, depending on those different factors that I talked about. Well, the first one is load duration factor. Um, load, load, load duration factor, if it's short term, so that would be uh, wind or earthquake, um, we could increase the capacity of our wood. 
standard term is dead loads and snow loads. Um, uh, uh, and dead loads when it's combined with uh, live and snow loads. If it's just wind loads, we can actually increase its capacity some. But most of the time, the factor is one, or we do nothing to it, it stays the same. If we have long-term loads, I just heard somebody, I hope it's just Dave. Um, dead loads by themselves, we can actually, uh, we actually have to reduce the capacity. That is not true if we're combining it with debt with live and snow loads. Uh, so this would be like um, uh, a giant blob of something that we might put on it. So machinery, so something heavy that could have a long-term impact on that lumber. Um, just a reminder, Dave, that I'm recording. Dave? Dave? Just a reminder that I'm recording. Um, so the next one is the system factor. When in doubt, use one. That does not mean use zero. That makes everything go to zero or pretty darn close to zero. Don't use zero if there's no system factor. Use one. Now, remember I said, don't even think about this if it's not a stud or a joist. And basically, if it's a stud or a joist, it's probably case two. What we're saying is, if we have plywood on the floor and a bunch of joists kind of going along like this, if you put all of your weight on only one joist, the plywood's gonna come along for the ride and try to pull down the two joists right beside it. So you get a little bit of increase in its capacity because it has things so close to it doing the same job. So we get to increase its capacity just a little bit. Now, if you've got it, it's case two. If you're building a normal house anywhere in Canada, it's case two. Visually graded just means how did they determine that it is um, uh, number one, number two, or select structural, or SS. That is how they grade most lumber in Canada. There are people that train and are specialists in looking at a piece of wood as it goes down a conveyor belt and going, that is a select structural, which is the best. That is number two, Ugh, that's a stud grade. So they go through and do that. I was at the Element 5 plant recently and they employ um, several um, visual graders, certified visual graders for their lumber so that they can assign it into the appropriate categories. So we get to increase it. The next slide is basically just all of the fancy terminology to say what I just said. Basically, if it's a joist or a stud, which is saying if it's closer than 610, so that thing that we repeat all the time, and there's a series of them, um, so there must be at least three of them, and they have to be no more than 610 apart. Well, we know our studs and joists are 400 on center, or 16 inches on center. Um, and they have to have sheathing on the top, which is our plywood, um, and that is going to be the majority of the time. We're just gonna get what we need out of it. Service condition factor. That is, is it outside or is it inside? So a dry service condition, which is inside your envelope. So anywhere that's inside your envelope is going to be a dry service condition. Our factor is one. There is one condition where it can be inside and it's not a dry service condition, and that would be in a pool environment. Those are so humid that we consider it to be a wet service condition. So, there are uh, criteria for what its dimension is and what we're doing with it. Are we talking about bending? Are we talking about shear? Are we talking about compression? Are we talking about its modulus of elasticity? So if it's wet, we look at its dimension and then we look at what it's doing and we pull our appropriate factor. Um, treatment factor, uh, untreated lumber, uh, in a dry or a wet service condition, the factor is one. What we're talking about here is mostly pressure treated lumber. So if anyone has ever built a deck that's not cedar, you've probably used pressure treated lumber. So basically what they do is they take the wood, they put it in uh, a, a, like a, a, a vault or a bin 
full of um, uh, a preservative that protects the wood from rot. It used to be this kind of green stuff that um, uh, looked really y- yucky and was a little tiny bit toxic. What they do now is actually a, uh, uh, and that was usually copper based. The one they do now, I believe, is brass based. Anyway, if you look at pressure treat lumber now, it's a light brown and it actually looks very comparable to cedar, but you used to be able to recognize it due to its bright greenness. Um, I usually can't distinguish it in situ from cedar now. Um, the only way I can tell is that uh, the pressure treated lumber is usually not as good a quality. Um, so it's usually a number one or a number two and on the low end of the number one, number two. And your cedars often look a lot better. Um, so even if it's pressure treated um, and it's not incised, it doesn't really affect its um, uh, capacity. What they're talking about is, so what they do is they push that under pressure, they kind of force that liquid into the lumber. I'm gonna draw a little kind of diagram for you here and I'll hold it up for you. So if that, will it focus? If that is the cross section of our lumber, when they uh, pressure treat it, It do, the pressure treating doesn't go all the way through, the, the, the treatment doesn't go all the way through the lumber. It kind of goes in something like that. What they'll do to incise it is they'll basically, they take this thing and it's almost like a roller and it like pokes holes in the lumber all down its sides. And so you've probably seen it. It looks like it was covered in staples almost. So they'll, they'll punch holes in it and then it pulls it out, so it's like a roller. It's like um, it's like a meat tenderizer. What that does is it forces the pressure treating in much further into the inside of that piece of wood. Um, uh, so you you protect it more from rot, but you can imagine you poke a bunch of holes in something, you're going to lower its capacity. So if it is incised, we reduce its capacity some. Uh, size factor. So remember I said if it's a small piece of lumber like a, uh, 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 a two by four and we're using it in bending, well we get to increase its capacity because we can look down the length of that piece of lumber and it would be very obvious if there was a flaw in it because we can see all of its sides very easy. There's not much hidden inside that piece of lumber. As we're getting to a very large piece of lumber, any flaws are hidden inside it. We can't see what's happening inside that wood. So there could be a massive flaw in there that we can't see. Even our professional visual graders couldn't see that flaw. So just in case we reduce its capacity. Okay, this is where I'm actually going to stop this recording and I'm going to go find an example where I go through pulling off some of those. Hold on. Okay, so I added a few little things, but I found the right spot to put it into the lecture. I realized there was a couple questions I asked you that I don't go through maybe to the depth that might help you. Um, so I just added those in quickly. So I'm... Uh, I'm really running short on time, so we're going to record this quickly. Okay, the equation for compression design, you are not going to have to do, but I want you to look at the equation for a column. So again, you don't have to use this equation. I'm not going to make you do it, but I want you to understand where it comes from. So here's our reduction factor. Remember, our factored load has to be less than our reduced capacity. Here is our reduction of our stress capacity. Remember, it all comes down to what our force is in combination with what its um, uh, uh, cross-sectional property is or a shape property. So times our reduction factor. So here's our reduction factor. Capital FC. Now this is talking about our stress. This is where we're discussing stress. And what they're saying here is 
Capital FC is when we take our lowercase fc, which is the stress capacity of our particular type of lumber, multiplied by these factors that we talked about. So we look up our specified stress for a compression parallel to the grain in a table, depending on if it is light structural framing, is it a post, is it a, post? Is it a beam, it, it, and we have to look at that table that tells us its classification for that. And then we can pull off what lowercase fc is. And then we have to look at all our factors. And then we can modify our strength capacity by those modifiers or by those factors. And then look at this. We have our cross-sectional property area for this one because it's compression. Uh, and so it's our cross-sectional area. So we're putting a load on it and we want to know what our cross-sectional area is. So it's B times D. That's the normal thing for a rectangle. And then look at this. We have a size factor in here. Look, the size factor didn't go into our strength. It didn't impact our strength, but it does impact its, um, its tendency to have different behavior. And then KC. Hmm. KC is a weird one, but look at the equation for KC. It's one plus a bunch of stuff with a to the power of negative something. This looks just like that lambda part of our steel equation. Basically, this is how slender it is. This classifies how slender our element is. Remember in steel, when it was really short, it was all about the compressive load. When it was really tall, it was all about buckling. And when it was somewhere in between, it was a little bit of both. So we're seeing the same thing here. When it's really short, this KC is not going to have any impact on our design. When it's really tall, KC is going to be the entirety of the design. When it's somewhere in between, it'll be a range in there. Now, again, we're not going to we're not going to do any of these calculations, but I just wanted to show you this. Let's take a look at the wood equation and the steel equation. So look at this, we have PR. Now PR is just another way to say CR. Um, uh, why in wood we use a different one, who knows? Sometimes even in other calculations, I'll use PR to talk about my compressive load. Uh, so they both have their reduction factor. They both have their stress. They both have their cross-sectional area. And then this has the factors for size and buckling, and this has the factor for buckling. And then embedded in this is all of those factors that can impact wood. So let's just break that down and think about what that means. For both of these, we have our reduction factor times our stress capacity, which remember that's the maximum stress we'll let this see. Steel, it was when it started to yield. In wood, wood is brittle, so it's just the maximum stress we want it to see, otherwise it'll fail times the area. And then we have some things for, for buckling and whether it's wood or not. But the fundamental components of the equation are identical here. So here is that same graph that I showed you for the steel one. Um, if it is a really short element, purple is its compressive strength capacity. Remember, it doesn't change. It's independent of the length of the member. So when it's really short, it is what governs the design. When it's really tall, um, we start to be taken over by buckling. When it's really short, buckling doesn't impact its behavior. So in that range between being really short and really tall, where it's totally governed by buckling, we have some combination of those two affecting its strength. So let's determine um, the strength stress of an 89 by 89 wood post that's 2.6 meters long in an interior environment, the wood is SPF number two untreated. Then let's use the load tables to determine its capacity. So we, we just wanna know what the stress is first, the stress capacity, and then we'll look up the, 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 to the actual capacity once we've added in all of our other elements. So we have a post, it's 89 by 89, and we know it's SPF number two, and it's untreated, and it's an interior environment. 
So let's go back to our tables. Let's go way back here. Okay, so I've added in the red lines just to say we're not even going to talk about those ones. So we know it's um, an SPF number two. Okay, well, that cuts this out, so it's not a stud. Um, it could be this category because we've got a number two. Uh, our smaller dimension is 89. Our larger dimension is 89. Perfect. Structural light framing. We get to use that. Let's just take a look. Could it have been post and timber? Because look, it's got a number two in its grade, so we could use that. But look, the smaller dimension needed to be at least 114. So we couldn't have used this because we're 89 by 89. So it looks like the structural light framing is our grade category. And that tells us what table we can use to pull off our FC. So spruce pine fir, because they said it was SPF, they said it was number two, so we get to use the number one, number two category. And we are talking about compression parallel to the grain. Our lowercase FC is 11.5 MPA. So look, lowercase FC, MPA. We've got 11.5. Remember our steel, 350. If it was a hot rolled section, 345. So let's see what our factors are on our strength. So remember, when we modify uh, our lowercase fc, it's kd, kh, ks, and kt. Let's take a look what those would be. Okay, so kd. There's nothing that told us that there was anything weird going on on it. Um, and it might have wind loads on it, but this seems to be just a regular old normal post. If we had, some, you, I wouldn't expect you to guess at these things. These are things I would tell you uh, that would be pushing the envelope. So if, I, if you heard me say wind load on something, well, maybe you want to look at this duration factor. If I said it's carrying heavy machinery sitting on it, well, maybe you'd want to look at this uh, load duration factor. Otherwise, it's going to be standard term, which means live loads and snow loads in combination with dead load. So, KD, one. System factor. It's a post. It's not a stud. It's not a joist. It is not part of a system. So, we're not even going to look at the system factor uh, case for this, which means we have a KH of one. Service condition, uh, well, it's inside, which means it's a dry service condition. So uh, KS for compression parallel to grain, one. And then treatment factor, they said it was untreated lumber, one. Um, size factor isn't part of this equation. So look, capital FC is just KD, KH, KS, and KT. So let's take a look. Where did my... Ah, here we are. They're just in the wrong order. I'll change those around. So here is all of those things we just pulled off of the tables. So 11.5 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, 11.5 MPA. So we can figure out what stress we get to use in calculating the compressive resistance of that post. Let's take a look at the load tables and see what we can get. Now, like most things I show you guys, I show you a big, long, complicated way, and then I give you a bunch of tables that can help you out. So let's go to our, ooh, I'll hide the answers for the quiz, our compression member uh, table here. Okay, let's go through. Let's take a look actually. Uh, does it have stud walls and posts? So that's where we want to be. We were talking about posts. Page 97. Let's go to, well this isn't that long so it's, this is just a portion of it. Let's see what we're at at page 30. What page is this? go to 10, page 100. So, so here's the description of stud walls and posts. They go through some examples. 
So if anybody wants more practice, there's more examples in here. Let's, oh, look at this, sawn lumber. Uh, so this is for stud walls. Well, we're talking about not a stud, but a post. So maybe we're a little bit further along. Ah, posts, here we are. Okay, wait. Oh, look, it's only one tiny little table. So posts, 89 by 89. We know we had SPF number two. Uh, our column is 2.6 meters tall. So somewhere between 2.5 and three. So let's take a look. We're gonna interpolate between these two. So we are going to have to pull off both the 2.5 and the three meters long. Because remember, as it gets taller, it has a tendency to buckle. So we've got 45.7 and 31 point, oh, no, 38.2 and 26.6 because it's number one, number two. Let's come back to our, uh, let's come back to our slides here. So here's that same table that we've just looked off. So those are, have been posted to Quercus for you. So here I've made the note that PR is just another way to write CR. It's our 89 by 89 post. SPF, number one, number two. Here's our 2.5 and our three, our 3.8, our 38.2 kilonewtons and our 26.6 kilonewtons. And here we are. So from the tables, we know at 2.5 meters what its capacity is and at three meters what its capacity is. We can linearly interpolate between those two. So for, uh, for a 2.6 meter tall post, CR is 35.9 kilonewtons. So all I've done is interpolate there. Some people like to draw a triangle, however it works for you. We just need to calculate the compressive resistance at that height. Okay, bending. Same as the compression, you're not gonna have to do this equation, but you have to know where these things come from. But look at this. We've got our material reduction factor is 0.9. FB, capital FB, that's the bending strength that incorporates factors. Well, here's how we calculate that. Very similar to how we did it for a column or a post. The duration factor, the system factor, the service treatment factor, uh, and then the treatment factor. Look at this, S is our elastic section modulus. Do you remember we did the one for a, uh, for a rectangle and for a rectangle it is BD squared divided by six. Um, so this is only elastic, we don't have plastic, so we don't have to worry about Z. Um, we have the size factor in bending and the lateral restraint factor. So I've pulled those kind of out a little bit because it's not part of figuring out the strength of uh, the material, but applied to the behavior of the element. Shear, huh, okay. This looks very much the same. We've got our shape, two thirds of our shape. Do you guys remember in steel, we looked at the stress profile of the element under shear and it kind of had this funny curve to it and we ended up only taking a portion of it or we averaged it out. This looks the exact same. We'll see it on the next slide in a second. F, capital FV, we look up our lowercase FV and apply all our factors, the ones we've just talked through. We've got a shape property and we've got a size factor because that's the behavior of the element, not the behavior of the material. Okay, in wood, we have our moment resistance and our shear resistance. In steel, we have our moment resistance and our shear resistance. If you remember, in steel, this capital FS had a 0.67 applied to it. So that's really two thirds. Let's take a look at these. If we, if we don't make them quite so complicated, let's just break it down to its purest kind of components. We have a reduction factor. We have our stress capacity. We have a shape factor. For bending, it's S, our section modulus. Uh, and for shear, it's two thirds of the area. And then we have our factors for buckling and the behavior of wood. 
but otherwise these equations are identical. They look a little different, but the components of it are identical. So let's do um, a wood exam or a bending and shear example. So determine the uh, the strength of the material uh, uh, for bending and shear. So the capital F V and the capital F B of an SPF number one, number two, 38 by 184. That's a two by eight at 16 inches on center floor joists to be used in a conventional house with plywood floor sheathing. Basically, they were telling us it's a system two case. So we get to use a case factor there, which is really great. Also use the tables to determine their capacities MR and VR. I put this in the wrong order again. Okay, so we want to figure out what the, the, um, the uh, factors are. Let's go way back. Sorry, I hate scrolling through. It makes people dizzy, I know. It's not as bad that we're not up on a big screen. Okay, let's figure out what grade category we need to be. So we have an SPF number one, number two. It's not this category. Uh, number one, number two, it could be this category. Uh, our smaller dimension is 38 but our larger dimension is not 38 to 89 millimeters. So that's not the category. So let's look at the next one. So number one, number two, that's great. Our smaller dimension is 38. Our larger dimension, is it 114 or more? Yeah, it's 184. So it looks like the structural joists and plank category is our category. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, structural joist and plank, great. So we had SPF, number one, number two, and our lowercase FB is 11.8, and our lowercase FB is 1.5. Okay, let's go to our factors. There's nothing that said there's anything unusual happening, so we're going to assume a standard term uh, load duration factor of one. I would be very explicit if it wasn't. I would be, you would see the words uh, long-term storage, uh, or heavy machinery, or you would see me say wind and wind alone. Uh, okay, so um, system factor KH, ah, they said it was uh, a conventional house with uh, floor sheathing on it. So case two was all about um, having um, uh, something close together that was uh, at least 610 apart or less than 610 apart. Well, we know it was at 16 inches on center, so we're good there. Um, and the joists, rafters, or studs are sheathed with plywood uh, or something else along that lines. So it's visually graded because we know it's number one, number two. That's the normal way we judge wood. Uh, so we get to use case two. Bending, our KH is 1.4. And for shear, our KH is 1.4. Great. Service conditions. It's inside, so it's a dry service condition. So KS for bending and KS for shear, both one. Uh, treatment factor. They're inside. There's no reason we'd treat them. Uh, so they'd be untreated with a one. The size factor is about the behavior of the element, not the behavior of the material. So it's not part of the, the strength modification. So let's go back and look at, all right, so here we are. We have our equation for FB and our equation for FB. We've looked up all of these things. We've looked up the lowercase FB and FV, and we looked up our factors. And so we can multiply them out here. Look, because it's a system, FB increases from 11.8 to 16.5, and our shear capacity for strength increases from 1.5 to 2.1. So we get a pretty big increase by these being in a system. They also told us we should use the tables to determine MR and VR. So I've gone to the PDF and pulled up the tables that are appropriate. So we have a two by eight SPF number one, number two, system two case. Oh, well, I didn't, I did embed those tables. They're just in the wrong order. Look at this. Uh, the length has nothing to do with it. We have number one, number two, SPF, 
38 by 184 for, a, there's a single member, which means it's not part of a case, or a system case two. So look at that, MR is 3.83 and VR is 10.6. I'll rearrange the order of these slides to make it flow a little better here. And so there we've looked up what those values are. Okay, let's do one quick calculation. I think I've got time for that before I have to get kids' lunches made before I pack up before the sitter gets here at 6.30. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna scroll through and see. Yeah, okay, all right. All right, so let's switch this to point downwards. Is it gonna be really badly shadowed? That's better, isn't it? Yeah, it's okay. All right, so we're designing a, a wood canopy for an existing building in Brampton. The height of the canopy is to be four meters, snow loads listed, the dead loads listed, the architect wants Douglas fir members. Does this look familiar? Does this not look exactly like the one we did when it was steel? So we have a lot of the same parameters here. So the first thing they want for the corner posts, what size do we get from sizing guidelines? Does a 140 by 140 Douglas fir number two work? And is, is there anything else we should consider? And what's the best square column we could use? Remembering, if we've met all of the other criteria, we want the cheapest one. So let's bring this up here. And I've got my handy markers here. All right. Okay, so we had last time already figured out that, actually, you know what? I might not even do this by hand. It's so, we already did all the hard part to a few, oh, that's not what I wanted to do, is it? Let me, wow, what did I do there, eh, everyone? That was bonkers. Okay, sorry folks. I'm not, I think I'm gonna just do this verbally, not on there for you guys. Okay. So we'd already, I'm gonna skip forward just a little bit and show you that we had already figured out uh, a lot of this. We had already figured out what the load on the column was. So none of that's changed. The load applied to the system is the same. The tributary area is the same, meaning that the load times the tributary area or our compressive force, our factored compressive force is still 23.3. We're now just looking at a wood post instead of a steel post. The architect has said, you know what, we want to explore this as a wood design. The interior of the building is wood. We want to match that. Why put on a steel canopy if we've got a wood interior? So first thing was sizing guidelines. We learned last week that for a wood post, a good dimension, or the minimum dimension is H divided by 30. So it says it's four meters tall. Uh, so four meters divided by 30 gives us 133.33 millimeters. We saw that um, out of the wood member sizes, I had told you that a six by six was something reasonable that we could use as a post, which is a 140 by 140. Remember, it's not the full dimension. Um, a six by six is actually five and a half by five and a half or a 140 by 140. So that would be what our sizing guideline tells us. Let's look in our wood post tables and see what the compressive resistance, they've asked us would a 140 by 140 work. <coughs> so let's look up a 140 by 140 Douglas fir number two that's four meters tall. Okay, so sawn timber, Douglas fir number two, square timbers that are 140 by 140 
and ours is four meters tall. Look at this, 68.4 uh, uh, kilonewtons of compressive resistance. It's got the little R here telling us it's the reduced capacity. So we know that 68.4 is greater than 23.3, so it works. They told us, to, they asked us to think about anything else that might impact this. It's outside. So, um, you know, if it's outside, we know we have a, wet, a wetness factor that we have to deal with. Um, so our CR should be less than 68.4, but we have a lot of extra capacity there. So it looks like maybe it's not too bad. Um, uh, so we know, we, know, we know it reduces a little bit because it's outside, but if you remember the range of those factors, it was like the lowest one I think was 89%. So we have, like we're more than double the capacity here. The other one they said was at least check and see, is there a better member? Now, we know that uh, we have to worry about that wet component. So, so here's the dry service condition. Let's just take a look. Um, it would want to be smaller, so let's, the only thing smaller is an 89 by 89 post, and we're four meters tall, uh, a number one, number two does not work, and even a uh, select structural, which is our highest grade capacity, doesn't work. So it seems like there isn't a better option, even without reducing this for the fact that it's outside in a wet condition it doesn't work. This CR is not greater than our CF, so it is not a contender. It doesn't work. So it seems like the best post was our 140 by 140, or our 6 by 6 Douglas fir post. So that's been summarized right here. That was pretty easy. We did one tiny little calculation because we had already done so much of the work three weeks ago. All right, if you remember in the steel design, we did the same thing when we talked about uh, the shear and the bending. So what's that? So they're saying for the beam spanning post to post using solid Douglas fir, uh, what could we use? So they say, what size do we get from sizing guidelines? They've asked us explicitly, does a 140 by 343 Douglas fir number one work? Again, is there anything we should consider? probably the fact that it's outside and in a wet environment. Uh, what is the best Douglas fir beam? Remembering that we like cheap, which means if all things are already satisfied, the smallest member is probably gonna be the cheapest member. Or the lightest member is gonna be the cheapest. And for wood, it's easy to tell that the smallest is the least amount of material. Steel, it's harder to tell. That's why we include the weight in the naming component of our W sections. Okay, let's go to my table here. <clears throat> A few weeks ago, we figured out what MF and VF were. We already did all that work. So half of the job we've already done. We know that MF is 35 kilonewton meters and VF was 23.3 kilonewtons. So we did that already. So they said sizing guidelines. Rule of thumb for a wood beam, lumber, D is the length divided by 14. We know that it's a six meter long beam. We have our diagram that tells us that. So it tells us that um, we need uh, a four, 429 millimeter deep beam. The tables I gave you only show a 140 by 394. If we were just doing this from preliminary sizing guidelines, we would want to suggest that maybe we should switch to glue lamp, that we couldn't do a solid sawn member. Now, we're gonna show why those are just preliminary calculations. They are not the final result. They do not take into account, you know, how heavily loaded they are, for example. Sometimes we might have underestimated and sometimes we might have overestimated. But in the early stages, it's not a bad idea to be like, hey, we should be really cautious here. We don't wanna get ourselves into a bit of a pickle. But they've asked us to go ahead with the full design. So the first thing they've said is we have a hunch that the sizing guidelines are a little too conservative on this project. Would you check explicitly that a 140 by 343 Douglas fir number one works? So we can go to the beam selection tables for sawn timbers that are 140 
that's a Douglas fir by 343, number one grade. We have MR equals 39 kilonewton meters and VR equals 43.2 kilonewtons. Let's go see if that works. Oh, look, yeah, that's great. We've got our MR is greater than our MF. Our VR is greater than our VF. It works. Uh, it's outside though. So MR and VR should actually be less than that. Those load tables don't take into account the fact that it's outside and has a uh, service condition factor that would be applied to it. We don't really know. I'm not making you go that far. Um, in the graduate course, we do go through that full, full calculation and do the, the bending calculation by hand. Um, uh, and so we're worried about that wet factor. Let's go look at that table. Could a 140 by 292 work? Uh, well, it wouldn't if it's a number one grade. If it's a select structural, we have MR is 38.4 and VR is 40.5. So that could work. So we are still greater than, so it could be a 140 by 292 Douglas fir select structural. So we would say, yeah, we think it does, but we'd have to go through and do the manual calculation because the tables don't account for a wet factor. So we'd have to go through and modify that ourselves and do that calculation. Again, that's beyond the scope of this course, so I'm not gonna make you do that. Let's take a look. We've now sized these members, whether they're steel or wood. So let's see what that does. I had turned that up when I was gonna do the calculation. <coughs> Okay, so in steel for the column, we had a little HSS. Here's our wood size that we need. So it's bigger. Let's take a look, uh, or weight per meter. So it uh, weighs a lot more in wood. Um, two years ago, the prices were comparable. Right now, they're a little bit higher, but certainly a lot better than they were in the spring, where this probably would have been closer to $150 per meter. The beam, here are their comparative sizes. Uh, the steel um, two years ago would have been more expensive than that wood member. Um, right now they'd probably be comparable. Um, one of the differences is, is that steel, you need to hire a fabricator. You, sometimes you can just go pick it up, sometimes you can't. Wood. A wood member this large, you're probably in the same boat. So which one's better? I don't know. I can't tell you that. I can give you all of this information, but fundamentally you're the architect and with my input, with this input, you're in a better position now to make a choice. You know, size-wise, yeah, they're comparable. The post's a little bit bigger, but maybe you can afford that space to be taken up. Cost-wise, it's going to be a little bit more to go for wood, but there's the aesthetic value and it's matching the interior of the building. So now you have kind of an arsenal of information to make an opinion about what you should do for that canopy. So this is really where there's a lot of back and forth between the architect and the engineer to find what's best for the project. Okay, so what are our takeaway tips? Uh, you should always remember that the wood strength depends on the wood species, that wood's organic and has all kinds of factors that impact strength, um, and wood column and beam design include something for buckling. Uh, generally, for our course, you should know the basic wood knowledge that I told you. You should understand the factors that impact wood strength and look them up and modify uh, the, the strength of the material. And you should know how to use the beam tables and column tables to find wood, a wood beam or a wood post that works. So this was a shorter lecture than most. Hopefully you guys can all take a breath. Um, next week we're going to jump into concrete. And what we're really going to focus on with concrete is the fact that it's composite, a thing we haven't really talked about yet. We have two materials doing things together to work together. And how do we account for that? Because they don't bend the same, they don't move the same, they don't have the same strengths. So how do we portion out our loads for things like that? So composite and concrete design next week. Have a great week team.